Hey, John here. Let's talk about networks. And by networks, I mean the kind that communicate data whose purpose in the simplest of terms is to move data from one place to another. A little bit like I wish I could move the margin of this paper over a little on the right. Sorry about that. Okay, so they uh, come in two most fundamental types, all right? You either have a point-to-point -point kind of a relationship between two things. I'm going to call them nodes. Uh, quite commonly today, they might be, you know, your laptop or a computer, okay? Uh, these two nodes can exchange data with each other if you connect a cable between the two, all right? One cable, two ends, directly connecting two nodes that can send messages back and forth, and you know, basically in this scenario and nowhere else, that's called a point-to-point -point network because the connections have two points on them. One example of the type of thing that is common in this scenario would be what we call an RS-232 link or a COM port uh, for you PC fans. The other fundamental type of network is a broadcast network where you take your nodes, okay, and you just hook them all up to the same giant wire or medium, okay? Uh, you may recognize this as the old school Ethernet. You used to have a, a coaxial cable bigger around than like this Sharpie pen that you would drill a little hole in the side of and you'd put a little metal connector on there and you would run a wire up for each one of the uh, computers or nodes that you put on an Ethernet network. And that's how that originally worked in like the 1970s. So let's make an observation here. Any node on such a network can send uh, one or more bytes, or I should say bits here, I X this off, one or more bits to any other node, simply due to the fact that they're directly connected to each other, all right? All right, uh, this node here can send bits to this one there, and this one can send them uh, different ones, or the same ones back, to uh, node number one. This node here can send bits out onto this network here, and if it does, what it's really technically doing is broadcasting them to every other node on that network at the same time. This one sends data down here. It then is sending no, uh, data to all the other nodes as well. Right? This one here, I've drawn these separate lines here suggesting that node 1 can talk to node 2 at the same time that node 2 sends data to talk back to node number 1. In a broadcast network, only one node at a time can send data because this medium here is shared. Even if it's a Wi-Fi network, eh, to some extent, all right, Wi-Fi has other uh, features and virtues and, and, and configurations of how it might work. We'll leave that for a, a discussion some other time. But in the simplest of terms, if something is sending data into a medium, be it over the air or over a piece of wire, or a fiber optic cable or whatever you're going to use for this, only one at a time can do that. Uh, I'd be amiss if I didn't point out that there's a variation of a broadcast network that can be wired that looks like this using something quite often called a switch that sits in the middle here. But really, it's basically still a broadcast network. This switch here basically allow it, this simplifies things, right? Each one of these machines can run a wire back to a single box, and it turns out that's a little easier to build and, and, and maintain than a scenario where you've got one wire running everywhere and all the nodes hook up to that thing directly. And the reason is, if this wire here was to get broken, let's say you, you, you cut it right here, what would happen? You'd essentially then have two networks, right? Uh, and maybe these nodes could talk to each other, and this one here could talk to some other nodes over here, but if you cut it, that will impact everything, okay? In this scenario over here, if you cut any one of these cables, what you've done is you've cut one single node off of this network. Turns out, whoever using this node over here, if this cable gets cut, they're going to complain, right? It's real easy to figure out where the problem is in a network that looks like this if a wire is damaged. It's not so easy if you have a system like this and the wire is damaged somewhere along the way. You might actually have to walk the full path of this cable that could be quite long and go through multiple floors of a, an office building or something like that. This may not be as friendly. All right, so what do we do with that stuff, okay? 
uh, in the simplest example that I could think of, imagine you have a, a simple terminal, what we oftentimes call a dumb terminal, and by that we mean a terminal that has no ability to process any data. Okay, These usually have a single keyboard and a display on them, and I can press keys, and every time I press a key, one data frame, we'll see, is sent from the terminal over to some computer or something, all right? The computer itself can also send frames of data back to the terminal anytime it wants. These can happen simultaneously, or they can happen one this way, followed by one that way, however you want to use it, all right? The idea is that a dumb terminal is used to allow you to send single characters every time you press a key to some server that'll process that information as it arrives. This machine can also then send uh, character data back to the terminal that displays these, it's called a glyph. You know, if you actually have a display that says ABCD, the way it looks, the, the, um, the phosphor and the dots on the screen and stuff, that arrangement is called a glyph, each one of the characters, okay? Now, there are some standard ways of organizing these uh, bits that go between the terminal and the computer and the bits that come back this other way. And there's a specification called ASCII, which stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And it outlines the code numbers for each of the keys on the, on the keyboard of a terminal in the code numbers for each one of the glyphs that the computer might want to say here, put a J on the screen somewhere, okay? We all have to agree on what bit pattern represents a J. Otherwise, if you have a terminal, it might, might print the wrong character, okay? And you'd like to be able to buy your terminals from your favorite vendor and stuff like that. So you want interoperability and stuff. There's other codes with names like Baudot that have to do with teletype machines. There is another code called EBCDIC that was very popular with IBM mainframes, they all kind of accomplish the same thing. They assign standard codes for each one of the items that might be exchanged between a terminal and a computer. And that brings us to a bit of terminology here, that which is a frame, okay? A frame is a collection of bits that represents a single message, okay? And the most fundamental level of data communicating, all right? So in the case of ASCII, a frame will contain a single character code, okay, or a byte, okay, that is sent from the terminal over to the computer and the same thing for computer back to the terminal for display, right? Other systems, a frame might actually have more bits in it. You could have a frame that's actually big enough to hold, you know, an entire database transaction. So this open-ended definition of what a frame really is allows us to choose whatever arrangement that we want, be it ASCII, Baudot, EBCDIC, or something else, okay? In the case of an Ethernet, okay, uh, a frame is, is given in a specification called 802.3, and in there, you'll see a description of what it means to send a frame of data over a cable like this. When you're ready to transmit, it will send a sequence of ones and zeros in this specific pattern. And when you're done, there'll be a special set of ones and zeros that represents the end of the frame of data that gets sent on this wire for all the other nodes to receive and interpret. Now, there's nothing that stops us from doing something like this, where any given node is actually connected to more than one other node, right? Now, as I've drawn this, these are uh, the point-to-point -point links that we've been looking at. But we also could do put a broadcast network over here, right? Maybe there's some nodes over here. Node 6, things like that, all right? You can build... You know, on top of these, you know, node one can talk to two, two can talk to three, three can talk to two, and five and six all together. But what if we have a situation where you want to have a conversation between node one and node three, or between node one and node six over here, right? How, how, how do we do this sort of thing? Well, if we're using a point-to-point -point network, we can just add another link here, 
Or you could just replace your entire network with a broadcast network and hook them all directly up, okay? But if you look into it, it might be that you don't have the ability to put a broadcast network in place of a point-to-point -point network. Maybe they're too far apart, right? Each one of these has limitations. It turns out point-to-point -point networks usually can go a lot farther than a broadcast network can. There was a, a length limit back in the Ethernet days when we used the big coax cable, right? turns out the cables in a point-to-point -point network, especially if they're fiber optic, can go many miles. And if they're radios, they can go all the way up to a satellite. So it does make sense to need to be able to solve a problem that manifests itself in this way, even if it goes over a broadcast network or a combination of different kinds of networks and things like that. So if we just look at this part of this equation here, and we ask a, set, a question, does node 1 have a way to talk to node 3? And as I said, yeah, we could probably put in a, a broadcast network over here if it's feasible, but if it's not, how then can we do this? Well, maybe we can put another point-to-point -point link in here and just connecting them all together like this, okay? Where well, node 1 is connected to 2 and 3, and 2 is connected to 1 and 3, and 3 is connected to 2 and 1. So anyone can talk directly to anyone else over each one of these single point-to-point -point connections here. But if you do this, you find out the math works like this. n times n minus 1 over 2 is the number of cables that you need to build what we call a fully interconnected mesh of all the nodes on a network where there are n nodes. So if you end up with 100 nodes, what is that? 100 times 99 over 2. That's 9,900 over 2. That's almost 10,000, right? Divided by 2 is 5,000 on the order of 5,000 cables in here. That's kind of a problem. 5,000 not too bad, but that's only for 100 nodes. What if you wanted to connect yourself to the Internet? How many cables would you need for all the nodes in the Internet to all be connected together? <laughs> that would be outrageous. No, it's not going to happen. All right. So what is the alternative? The alternative is to figure out how to allow a node that's between two other nodes, even if this is a point-to-point -point link here or a broadcast network over here that's not connected directly or part of this point-to-point -point link or a broadcast network that might be over here that connects these two nodes together, all right? So how many links do you need in this scenario? Well, that would simply be n minus 1. And to achieve that, you have to allow node 2 to forward messages on behalf of nodes 1 and 3. You know, one of the benefits of this, of course, you can save a lot of money if you don't need to add all the extra wires and connections between all these nodes. Now, as we'll see, in a scenario like this, node 2 is playing the role of what we call a router, okay? because it routes messages between other nodes. Some people say root. Now, notice that I use the word packets here. And more generally, I'll speak uh, using the word messages, okay? A message is a very generic term. A packet, as we'll see when we start talking about what this means down here in a minute, uh, refers to the kind of messages that this node here is dealing with. When we talked about sending bits back and forth between two endpoints, on a point-to-point -point network or between two nodes on a broadcast network, we refer to the sets of bits as frames. Now we're going to use this word here, packets. Now the word packet refers to the request that you send over to node 2 when you ask it to forward some data over to node 3. So what you're really doing is putting something called a packet into something called a frame that goes over to node 2. Node 2 looks inside the frame of bits and finds this thing we call a packet. And it performs some operation based on what the packet tells it to do, and that would be to send another frame over to node 3 with the same data in it so that node 3 can handle the uh, request that was made by node 1. Now that's exciting and all, but how do I download the entire series of Game of Thrones? You know, what, what really happens? 
is all that data and video and stuff put into single gigantic frame or a packet and then one giant thing is sent over some network no that's not how it works okay as we'll see what happens is if you need to move a single giant file like a video file of a movie or a series of movies what we'll do is we'll break this giant data transfer down into small pieces and there's another term here now called segments Each one of these segments is put into a packet. And then the packets are put into frames and handed off between intermediaries between the source of the data and the ultimate destination, where that ultimate destination machine has to put together all these segments back and get them into the correct order and reconstitute the single giant file that you wanted in the first place. Now, let's talk about what I was writing down here. Transport, OSI 4. What is all that about? Let's go back to the beginning. Physical, OSI 1. What we call the physical layer, or layer 1, is a description of how the physical interconnection between nodes is defined. We got like three different types here. Right, you get your point to point in your broadcast, and then you can subdivide broadcast into a single giant cable like this, what we call a bus, or we can put it using a switch into something that we might call a star. Okay, that is the physical manifestation of a network, and that is defined in something called OSI Open System Interconnect, and what it refers to as layer one. And we'll look at another diagram in a minute that shows you the relationship between all these, these layer numbers here. But bear with me a second here. So layer one, we look at the physical manifestation of the network, okay? And that includes the kind of cables, whether there's a switch in here or a bus, what kind of physical connectors are on the ends, right? Or a Wi-Fi, it might be a radio with antennas and things like that, all right? That is the physical manifestation of the network. Layer two also known as the data link layer, okay? This discusses how you use the physical network and, you know, of voltages and things like that that represents ones and zeros in that network. How do you send a sequence of bits in what we call a frame? So the data link layer that sits on top of the physical network, logically speaking, is where different ways, using things like the ASCII code, EBSIDIC, BOTO, or 802.3, if you're dealing with uh, one or more types of Ethernet, how does a frame represent a series of bits that can be constructed on one end and interpreted on the other in the intended manner? OSI layer 3, we call the network layer. This layer talks about things about how we go about routing messages using intermediaries. How does node 1 refer to node 3? What if node 2 is connected to node 3, node 4, and node 5 over here, and node 1 sends it a message? How does node 1 convey to node 2 which one of these to send it to? Okay, that's what's discussed in this so-called layer 3 specification. Now, layer four. How do you take all of the packets that are inside the frames that go between the various nodes and reconstitute them and break them into and reconstitute these things called segments to rebuild files, all right? That's your transport layer. Layer four. You'll notice it's one, two, three, four. So what we're really doing is working from the bottom up. Now, if we wander over to Wikipedia, we find a web page that they have on this open systems interconnect model. All right. Notice they have this numbered list over here, physical data link network transport. Now, these bottom four layers are what I've been talking about here. Physical layer, data link, network, and transport. So if we open these up, we might find some things that we all recognize in here. Physical layer, 
RS-232, in modern days, they rename EIA, TIA-232. Uh, 1960, it's changed its name a little bit, but that's your, your COM port on your PC. The uh, 802.3 is in here somewhere, where it is right there, okay? And they point out that it's a working group name, all right? The numbers here are the codes from the IEEE that provide in design specifications how things can work for standardized communication systems, all right? That is your Ethernet. What about the data link layer? Now, hiding again in here is 802.3, okay? It turns out 802.3 defines Ethernet in both the terms of its physical manifestation as well as how bits are to be framed and transmitted over that medium. Now, there's a lot of other ways to do this, too. Frame, relay, XS25, right? uh, PPP, SLIP, uh, ATM networks, and so on. There's a lot of different ways to send frames of bits around brings us up to our network layer. Here's our friend, the IP protocol. Okay, this is the basis of the entire internet. And it itself comes in two varieties, version 4 and version 6. And the world is in the midst of converting between version 4 over to version 6 as we speak. Uh, most of us are familiar with what is IP version 4. Unless you're running a wide area routing system or you're the phone company, the IP6 is not really in our faces on a day-to-day -day basis. And you'll see uh, other things in here like Apple Talk and, and ICMP, which is part of the internet as well. Now, if we move up to layer 4 up here, we see TCP, UDP, and some other protocols, all right? TCP is the number one protocol that we're all probably familiar with on a very intimate basis, whether we know that's what it is or not. This is how we access web pages. This is how most of what we consider the internet works, okay? UDP is another protocol that is uh, very common. A lot of gaming systems use UDP because of the way it manifests itself. UDP allows you to send small messages with a minimum of delay between two nodes. Well, TCP provides additional services that can slow down a conversation. However, the benefit of TCP over UDP, it allows you to send an entire stream of data, like if you're going to download an entire movie file. UDP only allows you to send small messages that are called datagrams. Now we can see there's other protocols we can use, but if our goal is to send data out into the internet, we have to use something that's based on the internet protocol, right? And the only ones that we have available today to do that are TCP and UDP. SCTP is possible, but it's not a very commonly supported protocol by most internet providers. So what we're really looking at then is the TCP and UDP transport layers. And that's what I'd like to focus on. And as we will see, there is another model that describes how the internet protocol works, but it only has these bottom layers. It doesn't have layers five, six, and seven. So I'm not gonna discuss those any further. Now, if we scroll down in this page, there's a couple of different diagrams, and there's a table down here. So in the hand-drawn diagrams I was showing you, what we were looking at are these four layers down here, and these are the simple descriptions of what these layers represent in the OSI model, okay? Notice we have bits, frames, packets, segments. The word datagram here is uh, the terminology used in UDP, and segments are the terminology that we use when we're talking about TCP. So what happens here? Let's start at the bottom. Transmission and reception of raw bit streams over a physical medium. That makes sense. A physical cable between two nodes in a network or a broadcast network concerns itself with these raw bits, voltages, what kind of wire is used, that sort of thing. Now layer two here, what the OSI model calls the data link layer, exchanges frames, 
and it has to do with defining ways to reliably send those data frames between two nodes that are connected physically together by a physically layer. So we say that the data link layer sits on top of, logically speaking, the physical layer. Or the data link layer does its job by using the physical connections in the layer below it. Okay? Layer three, the network layer, it sends packets. And how does it do that? It puts it in a frame and hands it off to this lower level data link layer, which converts it into the bits that are necessary to represent a frame that can be understood and handed off to the physical layer so it can be mo physically moved to another node on the network. Now notice over here, the network layer is involved in structuring and managing a multi-node network, including addressing, routing, and traffic control. See, there's the word routing. How in the world do you get a message between two nodes that are not physically directly connected to each other? Process of selecting a path of traffic in a network or between or across multiple networks. That's what routing refers to. Now, it also talks about traffic control. This is going to have to do with things like what happens if a node in a network gets too much data? What should it do if it can't, if it runs out of memory to hold all the, the packets that it has been asked to forward and, and route to another destination, right? It, it, uh, <laughs> spoiler alert, it throws them away. There's literally nothing else that can happen, okay? Now, addressing refers to how does one node refer to another node? You know, how do I ask a node to route a message on my behalf. How do I address that, right? If you think of these packets as letters that you might throw in the mailbox, now how does the Postal Service know where to, go, to, to deliver those, right? Well, I'm going to ask this intermediary, the postal system, to take that letter. It might give it to another post office or put it on an airplane. It could be handed off between many different entities, right? We call those hops when it comes to networking. I give it to my local carrier. The network carrier takes it and brings it to the local post office. They might put it on a truck who goes to an airport who puts it on a plane that flies it somewhere else. So it goes through all of these hops, we say, all right? How does it get to where it's going? Well, obviously, the address that I wrote on the envelope is the thing that tells each one of those people that are in charge of managing each one of the hops along the path that it will take to get to where I want it to go. It tells them how to deliver it to the next place along the path of where it's got to go. Layer four, the transport layer. What does it do? It reliably transmits data segments between two points on the network. Notice it talks about segmentation, acknowledgement, multiplexing. So what does it say about segmentation, right? Process of dividing data packet into smaller units for transmission over a network. Segmentation happens at layer four, blah, 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 blah. This is probably a very bad choice of wording right here. They probably should have said data stream. Because the word packet here has a very specific meaning down here in layer three. I can assure you that layer four up here does not divide a network packet into smaller packets. No, it does not. This does exactly what I said earlier. If I want to move a large file, this layer here will take that file, which we refer to as a stream usually in the terminology used when we say, here, layer four, please move this stuff. We provide it in what we call a stream of data. It will take that data stream and break it into segments and then hand off each of those segments into layer three, which will ensconce that data segment into a packet, hand it down here to layer two, which will put that into a frame that will then be given to what is usually like an operating system driver or something like that, which will take the bits in the frame and send them out one at a time using the physical connection to your machine. All right. 
acknowledgement will have to do with the uh, attempt at, I should say, reliability. Now, the word reliable, when you talk about the layer four here, I've always had a hard time with the fact that my definition of reliable means certainty. Okay, it turns out that in the context of layer four here means as reliable as possible. It is definitely not certainty. Okay, now uh, what, what we'll see here is the notion of acknowledgement simply means that once you've sent this stream of data, by breaking it into segments and handing it off to the layer three and so on to get it to go to the other end. What you do is when you're done with those segments, you can ask the node on the far end of your conversation, so to speak, to please acknowledge that it got those segments, okay? So that if you do get an acknowledgement, you can count on the fact that the destination got each one of those segments that you asked it to acknowledge. Now, multiplexing in this context, refers to the fact that I can have multiple simultaneous streams of data flowing between two nodes in a network. Or I can even have multiple streams of data flowing between one node in a network and many other nodes at the same time. Now, as I said before, I'm not going to discuss these top three layers right now okay if you scroll down here we'll probably see why <laughs> in a longer uh, form description of what the layer four does in the osi reference model we'll see a paragraph down here that says although not de developed under the osi reference model and not strictly conforming to the osi definition of the transport layer, the TCP and UDP protocols that are in the internet protocol suite are very often, very commonly categorized as layer four protocols as defined by the OSI. Notice there's all these other protocols as well. There are many ways to communicate between machines. The internet is only one way. The OSI reference model is a description that includes many types of communication systems. I'm only going to focus on one, which is, as I said, just a subset of the OSI reference model. Now, of course, that begs the question, why am I even mentioning the OSI model if all I really want to do is talk about TCP and UDP? Well, it's because in conversations... You'll hear people talk about layer four and layer three. And in order to understand what they're talking about, you need to understand they're referring to the layer numbers in the OSI reference model. Now, let's leap over to the Internet Protocol page in Wikipedia. So we go down here and we look and see, oh, you know, the Internet Protocol Suite is a conceptual model of protocols and so on. It was developed, um, you know, by a grant from the Department of Defense through a program called DARPA, and this was done at a time that, as they point out, predates the OSI model. And it also mentions, like I just did, it's a more comprehensive reference network for general systems, okay? So TCP IP, or the Internet Protocol Suite, is a very specific network model that is a subset of that which is covered by the OSI model. Now, because the Internet Protocol Suite uh, predates that of the OSI model, some of the terminology might differ a little bit. But as we'll see, it still covers the general functionality that's defined in the bottom four layers of the OSI model. So as we see described up here in this paragraph, what we see is that the Internet Protocol model consists of a thing called a link layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. Okay. Now, if you scroll down a bit, you'll see a diagram down here, and it kind of shows this uh, relationship between the layers, just like the OSI model did that we looked at a minute ago. And what we have where the OSI model has its physical layer and the data link layer, that is the 
OSI names for their bottom two layers are combined and kind of uh, lumped into a single layer in the Internet Protocol model. Above that, in the OSI reference model, they have the network layer, and in the Internet model, it's just simply called the Internet layer. They both have a transport layer, and their transport layers both accomplish the same overall uh, basic uh, functionality. And that is that it takes a stream of bytes from a higher layer abstraction, where the Internet model refers to as the application layer. It breaks it into segments and hands them down to the next layer as packets, which then hands them to the next layer as frames and are sent out over the physical connection between the various nodes that comprise your network. So what do we got? If you have two hosts that are connected by two routers, okay? So what you have is a physical link between host A and a router. This router is then connected physically to another router over here. This router is connected physically to host B. How does A and B communicate with each other using the Internet Protocol Suite? All right? So that's what's being shown down here. Host A runs a program. Maybe I wrote a program that opens a file, takes it, and tries to send it to another program that's running over here on host B. Maybe the program on host B is a web browser, and the web browser is asked, please send me this video so I can watch it, right? So, well, host B would have to send a message to A in order for that to happen, and then A would go and open up that file and then send the file over to B. Now, it would be nice if the Host B over here showed the file while it was arriving and not wait until the entire data got over there and then showed it, right? What we would refer to as a streaming video player, okay? So how does that work? Well, in the point in that description where this application on host A over here opens the file and starts sending it over to the player, a web browser or player on host B, what it's doing is it's reading a stream of bytes out of a file. And it's saying, hey, I want to send a bunch of bytes in a way that can get over to a program running on host B over here. Please take care of that for me. Okay? So the transport layer says, all right, I'll take this stream of bytes. And as they arrive, it breaks it into pieces, which, which we'll see are called segments. All right, And those segments are then given to the Internet layer, which breaks them into packets, which are then given to the link layer, which then, as we say, encapsulates those segments into packets. And the packets are then given to the link layer, which again encapsulates them into frames that can then be handled in transmitted using the physical connection between host A and the next device in this chain of connections on its way to where it's got to go. Each one of these connections is often referred to as a hop. Okay, You would say that host A is one, two, three hops away from host B. All right? So and every time a a unit of data, which the OSI model refers to as a PDU or a protocol data unit, right? In the bottom layer down here, the physical transfer has happens in a data unit that we call a frame, is sent from this stack, as we say, this protocol stack, all the layers stacked up like this, is what people refer to when they're talking about a protocol stack, so that it can flow from host A over to this first node one hop away. In this case, it's a router. Now, this diagram, what it's attempting to show is that my application is sending a stream of bytes and this transport layer is breaking that stream of bytes into segments. So the discussion that takes place between application and transport is in terms of a stream. 
the discussion that takes place, you know, the data exchange. When I call a library function, I'm giving it a continuous stream of bytes to send here. When this calls a subroutine that's provided in a library that supports the internet protocol, this conversation is done in terms of segments. When the internet layer, or that library call that's made down there, calls another subroutine from a library that represents the functionality of the link layer down here, what's passed down there is a packet. So what happens is the frame that goes between this link here and this link there has this packet inside of it. So when the link software that's running on this router over here gets a frame, what it does is it takes the packet out of the frame and it gives it to the internet library software that's running on this router. And because that packet has all the information it needs to figure out what to do with it. You know, what's the next hop it needs to take? If this router was connected to 10 other routers, you know, which one would it use? It has everything it needs in the packet that was given to it by the link layer here. All right. Now, in other words, it doesn't know or care about the segments that are involved between the transport and the internet layer over here. It doesn't care that it's a movie file. It doesn't care that it's part of a bigger thing. All right. That's the big takeaway here. Once a router can see or receive a packet, it doesn't need to know anything else. It can immediately make a decision of what should happen to this thing next. And that is, in this scenario, give it to the router over here. So what it does is it hands it back to the link layer and tells the link layer, for example, I know I got it from this physical interface over here, but what I want you to do is resend it out this other physical interface over there, at which time the link layer re-encapsulates it into a new frame, okay? Because, you know, just because I might use Ethernet over here for this hop does not mean that the router is using Ethernet over here to talk to this other router. Okay, it might be using PPP over a dial-up connection. Maybe these routers are really modems, okay? So don't uh, oversimplify this in your head, okay? And in this scenario down here, we got Ethernet coming in. It comes back down. Now it's going to go to a fiber or satellite, or like I said, maybe it's PPP, all right? So a frame comes in. Maybe, you know, another analogy is it arrives in English, turns around, maybe it has to be sent out here in French, okay? It, how it goes out doesn't have anything to do with how it came in, right? What really matters is that the frame that arrived this way has a packet inside there. The packet that goes up here and the packet that comes down there are actually the same. But when this software that represents this internet layer here in this router sends the packet back down to the link layer. You know, the subroutine call would have multiple arguments in it, for example. It's like, hey, well, here's the packet back, and oh, by the way, I want you to send it out this physical address over here, and I want you to do it in this way or whatever else it needs to know to do its job. This layer will tell the link layer uh, all those items, okay? Link layer then puts it back into a frame and sends it out this other physical interface. This router over here does the same thing. It arrives in there, says, okay, I got a frame. And inside there, it looks, you know, I like it as a packet in there. So it takes the packet out, gives it up to this internet layer software in this router, and it does the exact same thing. It may or may not have multiple things connected to it. Right? So it has to decide, well, which physical interface should I have it sent to next? Makes all the same decisions, sends it back down to the link layer and says, okay, I want you to send it out this one over here and I want you to do it in this manner. And link layer says, okay, makes it into a frame. 
okay? It takes the packet and turns it into a frame by adding stuff to it as needed by the physical interface that it's going to use, and it sends it then over to host B. Now, once it gets on to host B over here, we see a little bit different thing sort of happening here. We see that the frame arrives, the packet is removed from the frame, the frame is then thrown away. Packet's given to the software library that handles the responsibilities of the internet layer, okay? At which point it, it realizes that that packet actually contains a segment that's part of a stream of data that needs to be given to an application that's running on the host. So rather than turning it back around again and saying, hey, well, now forward it somewhere else, it then calls another subroutine in its software library to deal with the fact that a segment has arrived and the transport, among other things, is going to ask a couple of questions about that segment. Is this the next one that I'm supposed to send up to the application up here? Right? Now, what if... Uh, for example, the application sends a frame down here that has a segment in it, you write a packet with a segment in it, and it wanders along here and it, it becomes corrupted, or maybe there's a loose cable and the packet disappeared. And then, you know, it sends another segment down here to be delivered over there, right? So this over here is counting them all. So it's the responsibility of the transport layer it's running on host B over here to count all those segments to make sure that they all are delivered and they're all in the correct order. I mean, the last thing you want to do is watch a movie or listen to a sound file and have it all played in the wrong order. Oh, let's have it end and then have the beginning. And no, <laughs> we have to make sure they're all in the right order. We also want to make sure that there's nothing missing. Okay, so what happens is when the segment arrives... This transport library code in here has the opportunity to send a message back over to the transport layer over here by just doing the whole thing in reverse and saying, hey, I'm missing one. Please resend that. And this one can then say, oh, okay, fine. I'll send the missing one back over here. And there's all kinds of optimizations that are way beyond what we're going to talk about here that have to do with things like, well, should the transport layer just throw away everything, waiting for that missing packet and then start over? You know, that's a whole subject for a whole other discussion. All right. Optimizations are not our concern right now. But let's just assume for this particular example that, you know, the missing segment does arrive. It's then put back in the correct place so that the correct order of data is sent up to the application up here that in this scenario might be playing a movie or something. Now, it is that notion that the transport layer here counts all the segments and makes sure that they're all in the right order and that there weren't any missing that have to do with what we refer to when we're talking about a reliable protocol. Reliability does not mean it is reliable, okay? It's kind of a weird thing. I always had trouble with that use of that word when we talk about reliable data transfers. What they're really referring to is if data gets from point A on host A to host B over here, then it will be delivered in the correct order. And there won't be duplicated sections. There won't be out of order. It won't, you know, that sort of thing. That's what they mean by reliable. So there's a giant if in that expression. If data does get from A to B, will it be delivered in order and without duplication? Another thing that the transport layer can do is know that it got the whole thing. So one more bit to that is, and it is not truncated, okay? Did they get the whole thing? Is it in order? <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Now, if you think back to what's going on here on these routers, okay, they're really receiving a frame, looking at the packet in the frame, and forwarding it along. Notice that the routers don't care. They don't even know if the packets that they receive are in the right order. Now, remember in the OSI model, it turns out the same thing happens in the Internet model when it comes to what happens 
if a router or a host gets too much data for the amount of memory that it has when it's bringing it in, thinking about it, and forwarding it back out, what does it do? It throws them away. Okay? So it turns out these routers don't know, in a way, what kind of damage they might be causing by throwing away those packets. Nor do they care. Okay? Why? They don't care because they don't even have a transport layer library of code inside these routers. They're only dealing with the packets. All right? That's the big takeaway why this is truncated in here. It doesn't matter about the order of the packets. It just tries to do a best effort at forwarding them along to where they want to go. so that the ultimate destination over here can think about all of the packets that contain the segments and decide ultimately what they really want to do. Are they going to reorder them? Are they going to send a message back over here to the source of the data that says, oh, I missed a piece, please resend it, that sort of thing. That all happens up here, and it's not the concern of these routers during the delivery of what are just packets from the perspective of the routers. So what does all this mean then? It boils down to how do the layers in a protocol stack exchange layers, I should say data, sorry, <laughs> with each other, right? How does the application layer send stuff to the transport layer and so on? So let's look at this example. Let's say I have an application and I want to send a, some stream of bytes. Now, you know, that might just be simply an array of data. That is my data stream. Let me change colors. We can have a nice highlighted diagram here. All right. So let's say an application wants to send some stream of bytes. What does it do? It says, take this array whose length might be, you know, a megabyte or something like that and pass it to a library call that implements the transport protocol for the internet. And what is that thing going to do? Okay, well, it's going to break it into segments. And it's going to do something along the lines of this, right? In a very abstract way, it's going to say, I need to break this maybe into three byte segments. Right? This is an extreme example. Usually it'll break it into a couple, like a kilobyte packet or something like that. But the bottom line is it has to break it into pieces. And each piece, as you can see, the first, say, three bytes go into this piece. The second three bytes go into this piece over here. These pieces, these segments, right? They need to be numbered. They need to be identified to which one comes first, which one comes second, and so on. So along with the data for this segment, there's a header. It goes along there with it, all right? So there's always these headers. There's the header, and then there's the data. Sometimes I'll call the data the payload, right? This segment has a data payload, and it has a header. Among other things, the header in a transport packet for the Internet would be the sequence number that represents where this goes in the greater sense of things. Should they get out of order? Or maybe it gets uh, 80 of them get received on the far end and one of them's missing and the other end can say, I need this one, so it doesn't have to resend all of them, okay? Now, once it's turned into a segment, the transport layer then takes the segment and sends it to the network layer. Now, the network layer concerns itself with where it's going. This is like addressing an envelope, okay? Where does it go? It puts a to address in there. I'm going to abbreviate the word address like that with these at signs. And it's from whatever my address is. This is the return address, okay? And its payload, just like this transport layer took the data from the stream and put it in the payload of its segment. Well, the payload of a packet is going to be the segment, all right? So look at this, what's going on here. I got a bunch of data I want to send. I break it into pieces. I put a header on some of the data, send it down to the next layer. He puts a header on what he was asked to send, and he sends it to the layer below him, okay? This thing here is the packet, 
The packet is the thing. Finally, it has you know a to and a from address on it, right? That's the big difference here as we make this leap, as we get closer to the physical layer where we're actually going to send it somewhere. Now, the link layer in the Internet Protocol, what it's going to do, it depends on the kind of physical connection that you're going to send it over, all right? But in many general terms, what happens is there's some sort of a synchronization that has to take place that usually means when you send these bits, right, this frame, right, which convert the packet into a frame, and there's usually a header and sometimes there's a trailer that goes into this frame of bits that we send out on our network connection, okay? The synchronization here is what announces here is some data. Okay? And this is all very dependent on what kind of wiring and everything else you're using. But usually what there is is something, some bit pattern in here that announces, hey, I have a frame. What follows is the data that represents a frame. Okay? Then it'll simply send the data from the network layer, the packet, followed by a trailer. Now, quite often you'll see these things called cyclical redundancy checks. And if you don't know what they are, the short of it is, it is a result of a mathematical function that could be applied to all the bits in the frame. In the simplest of cases, you know, let's say I just add together how many one bits there are in the frame, and I put that number in here. You know, I might have all these bytes in here, all, a lot of bits. How many bits are ones? Well, maybe there's 72 of them. Again, this is an outrageously trivial example. But the point is, when the link layer sends all these bits and that number, the result of a mathematical function that it applies to all these bits, and it is received by another node or a router or something, that other node can perform the same mathematical operation and then ask itself, does this result match and if the answer is yes, it can be somewhat assured that the data in here was received properly. You know, if lightning strikes or something like that, while this data is being sent, there could be some bits that get uh, jumbled around, could become garbage between uh, the time it's sent and the time it, it's received on the other end of that uh, uh, of the physical connection. All right, that's the point of this thing. Now, when a node receives a link, we look at this going the other way, right? So this is, when you go down this way, we're thinking about in terms of transmitting data from a node, from an application on a node, out a physical interface. When another node receives a frame, performs the mathematical function, finds out it's okay, it takes the guts out of that frame and says, okay, this is a packet. I'm going to then pass this along to the software library that knows how to deal with packets in the network layer. And what that's going to do is it's going to ask, hey, is this packet addressed to me? Or is it addressed to something else? Now, what happens when you get an, a letter in the mail and it's not addressed to you, right? Well, you got two basic options. One, you could throw it away. Or two, you could say, well, I'll, I'm a nice person. I'll, 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 I'll take it back to the post office and say, hey, you know, this isn't for me. You're a router when you do that. Okay? So if the node is itself a router, then most of these frames that it receives will have packets in them that are not addressed to the router. So the router will look around and say, okay, I have you know, other physical connections. Which one of them is the most likely to get this closer to where it needs to go? That router would re-encode it using whatever its other link is, whatever link it decides to forward it out of, recalculate a CRC and all this other fun stuff and send it out. And it'll go along, hopping along until it gets to the ultimate destination when that node receives it, checks it all out, finds it's okay, extracts the packet, it'll find out that the to address that's in that packet is its own address. 
when that happens, it has FYI. By the way, it came from this other node. And it can take out this segment information out of this packet, pass it to another library of code, and says, okay, you deal with this segment and, and do whatever you need with it, okay? And then that will say, all right, this is segment number one. And obviously, it would need to keep track of whatever segment it saw before and that sort of thing and ask the question, does this belong in the current sequence of segments that I've expected to receive? And in other words, can I put this into my buffer where I'm recreating this stream up here? Now, if it got segment two first, and then it got segment one, it could opt to take the data from segment two and put it in here and leave garbage everywhere else. Now, it does that provided that it doesn't tell anyone that it did that, okay? It can put it in there and then hold its breath and see, oh, I hope segment one comes along later. And if it does, aha, I do, now I can put the ABC in there and combine it with the DEF, and it then has this much of the whole stream all reconstructed and ready to go, to which it could start, if it wanted to, start passing it to the application layer because the application layer doesn't want D, E, F, A, B, C, and then some random thing over here and over there. No, 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 it doesn't want that. Uh, when this happens and it reconstructs the bytes in the right order, it can incrementally, or it could store the whole thing and then deliver the whole thing, however you want to do this. Depends on your software library, right? It passes it back to the application layer, and it does with it what it wants, okay? So this is how this thing basically fits together. And as I show over here, if the application really wants to send a lot of stuff after the first segment goes out, becomes a packet and a frame, and it's transferred along, the transport layer will then take and construct its second segment, put it where it belongs inside of this packet by passing it along to the network layer, okay, who adds the to from and so on, and it passes it back down to the link layer again. So this is the second frame containing the second packet. Of course, this should be a two here. Sorry. <laughs> it's not, I can't argue it's a typo. It's a righto, okay? Uh, and uh, that, of course, is the second segment up here, which is the second portion of the bytes out of the stream that the application is trying to send, all right? So this kind of hopefully gives you a better visualization of how these things kind of fit together and uh, this notion of the adding a header followed by the payload that gets passed along as things go down these layers and, again, how they come back up as they get closer to the receiving end. So what do we know then? The OSI model has seven layers in it. The internet model has four. Roughly, the relationships work like this. In the internet model, the link layer is responsible for the data link and physical layers of what the OSI model is defined. The network layer and the transport layer in the two models roughly are the same sort of thing. On the internet model, sometimes the network layer is called the internet layer. And the application layer in the internet model is responsible for dealing with the session, presentation, and application layers that are in the OSI model. And briefly, what happens in here is OSI uh, discusses things like whether or not the data exchange between two nodes is compressed or not. That sort of thing happens in presentation. And the session layer here is responsible for things like, uh, like, let's say I'm sending a file between two nodes and I start sending it okay and there's a problem. Maybe my internet goes down. When I reconnect later, can I resume the transmission of that file or not? Or do I got to start over, right? That's the kind of thing that can happen in the session layer, which leaves us with just the application layer here. Okay? In the OSI model, the application layer has less work to do than it does in the internet model. Okay? If the application is a web server, for example, and you want to use an encrypted connection, well, the encryption might be taking place in these layers down here in the OSI model. Where in the internet model, when you write your web server, you have to deal with all the encryption yourself as part of your application code. 
I hope this has shed some light on what all these layers are and how they kind of fit together in order to achieve the task of getting data moved from one node in a network over to another. Thanks for watching. See you next time.